if we can stop sharing the screen we are live hello good good evening mathur sir make yourself unmuted good evening, good yeah. evening everybody good evening yeah. good evening good evening So, Dipanchu, we are live now. Uh, very good evening to one and all. Uh, we are here for our. Uh, we have gathered here for another session of medical legal aspects in ophthalmology. Uh, just to give an a brief overview of what we have done. Uh, we started exactly one year ago with a uh, when under the guidance of Dr. Kaushik Tripathi and Dr. Arthi Heda, and we started with this survey. Uh, following this. Uh, with an overwhelming response, we got a uh, we got a session in AIOS last year in Mumbai, and after this, we have started a series of webinar which concentrates on a particular topic. That that is, we have uh, had six five sessions so far. The sessions have been on consent, consumer protection act, record keeping, indemnity insurance, how to respond to a legal notice. Today, we have gathered here for another exciting session, uh, which is. the current hot topic that is the medical legal issues regarding cluster tas and cluster end of thalmitis uh, we have stalwarts of both medical and legal uh, fields uh, in ophthalmology with us in panelists as well as speakers first i would like to introduce to you uh, our panelists so first we have dr anand deshpande sir who is the director of guru prasad netra rangnalay aurangabad so, sir is also the uh, very renowned medical legal consultant next up we have dr manoj chand mathur sir he is from Saru, he is working he is the consultant of the ophthalmologist at swarup eye center hyderabad and also uh, med, my medical legal consultant next up we have dr prakash marathe sir who is uh, past president of various state and uh, pune ophthalmic societies and he is also the managing he has been the managing committee member of iius and also the chief coordinator for consent book of uh, various procedures in marathi we welcome all the panelists next Uh, i would like to introduce to you uh, our speakers uh, they all they all are very renowned first up we have dr haripriya arvind ma'am who is uh, alumni of uh, arvind eye hospital and she was for decades she was the head of cataract and eye services at arvind eye hospital madurai currently she is the chief of iol and cataract services at arvind eye hospital chennai she has more than 50 publications in peer reviewed journals and madam has received various awards that she has many recognitions to her credits uh, on national as well as international platform she is madam will be enlightening us with a talk on cluster task and how to ma manage it medically next up we have dr sapnil prachand sir who, who is an alumni of pgi uh, he has also worked at chipmar pondicherry currently he is the uh, consultant at uh, mgmi institute raipur in the department of vitro retina urea and rop services Uh, dr sapnil sir has more than 35 pubna cited publications and over 100 presentations on various national and international con conferences sir is also the reviewer of various international journals like ocular immunology and inflammation bj bmj case reports sir has also written a couple of book chapters on oct uh, it is an honor for me to introduce him on this platform as he is also my mentor from surgical vitro retina fellowship last we have dr anand desh pande sir Uh, sir is uh, i have already uh, there is besar needs no introduction this is not moving uh, sir is director of uh, guru prasad rang netralay in aurangabra and sir is medical legal consultant of uh, medical uh, sir is a renowned medical legal consultant sir has written uh, also written books uh, book on legal aspects in ophthalmology sir will be giving us a legal as a legal overview of these two topics Uh, so i would request dr haripriya arvin ma'am to please share her screen and give her talk thank you dr dipanshu uh, is my slide visible yes ma'am so i'm going to be giving an overview on toxic anterior segment syndrome TAS, as we know, is an inflammation that involves primarily the anterior chamber of the eye. Uh, it was first this uh, term was coined in 1992. There is another term called as toxic endothelial cell destruction syndrome, which has more localized cone endothelial damage. So the typical features are usually hypopia and this uh, limbus to limbus cone edema. In severe cases, some patients will also have fibrillin damage. So this can range from a mild, moderate to a severe disease. 
the good thing is most often TAS is self-limiting. So these are uh, some images of patients with TAS. The image on the left has a minor uh, corneal endothelial damage, whereas the one on the right has more damage. Not all patients have corneal edema. Some patients may only have inflammation and iritis with hypopion with a clear uh, cornea as well. Uh, IOP in these patients are mostly raised, and this is because of the severe inflammation. There may be patients who also have a uh, decreased IOP. The hypotony is because of some amount of uh, shutdown of the ciliary body. But in these patients also, over a longer period of time, there may be trabecular vestibular damage and raised IOP uh, can occur later on as well. So in this patient, as you can see, there is some uh, coronal edema with the hypopion, and this patient was treated medically with topical steroids, and the patient, after one week, cleared up almost 90%. There is some DM force, but most often, this is a self-limiting disease. Whereas in severe TAS, is something we have to be more careful about. In any patient with severe inflammation, the first thought we have to have in our mind is end of thermitis. Only when we have a Gram's negative report and we are sure this is only anti inflammation, you would consider it to be a TAS. In this patient, along with the hypopion, there's also some amount of fibrin membrane. And this membrane is an indication for having an anterior chamber wash. So this can be treated with topical steroids as well. But in this patient, we did an anterior chamber wash because this will help to hasten the healing process and reduce the chance of PCO. The same patient after the AC wash and a few days later, the eye cleaned up uh, quite well. So sometimes they also benefit from an anterior chamber wash and if required, eye oil explantation as well. So treatment topical is typically with steroids, penicillin acetate. Now this can be started only if you have ruled out endophthalmitis. So you'll have to first uh, have that. I think the most important thing is to not miss endophthalmitis and overtreat uh, patients as TAS. So that is the most critical thing. But once you are uh, more in favor of TAS, you will start with the prednisone acetate eye drops uh, every hour. Uh, in severe cases, they also benefit from oral uh, steroids as well. Topical NSAIDs can also be added for pain control. And we also like to give frequent broad-spectrum antibiotics like moxifloxacin, especially when it's difficult to say if it is a clear TAS or endophthalmitis picture. Now, follow-up is very important, more important to see if the patient is uh, response to treatment. If it doesn't, then this can also be an ophthalmitis. So in those patients, a repeat culture is mandatory because then you may have a culture positivity. Or the inflammation may also spread to the vitreous and posterior segment, in which case the treatment has to change based on the uh, presentation. Like I mentioned, certain interventions may also be useful like uh, antechamber washout or vitrectomy or eye oil removal. Uh, and in cases where there is very severe corneal endothelial damage, one can also consider corneal transplantation. Now, difference between TAS and endophthalmitis, broadly TAS is only in the anterior segment of the eye. And these patients are always gram-negative. Endophthalmitis is anywhere within the eye, mostly involving the posterior segment. And the patient, you may or may not have gram positive or you know culture positive organisms. The etiology for these uh, for TAS would range from the source being irrigating solutions, which is altered chemical composition, incorrect pH, or incorrect osmolarity or preservatives, could be because of ophthalmic instrument contaminants. Now, if one uses enzymes or uh, no, any of these uh, uh, detergents can also cause a task like picture or denatured uh, uh, viscoelastic as well. Ocular medications could also be a source of TAS when there's incorrect drug concentration, pH, or osmolality. Or the medication also has various preservatives. IOVs also have been proved to cause TAS, and this has been reported to either be because of the polishing compound or the cleaning and sterilizing compound. So these are the broad areas which basically cause a task, but there could be anything right from even using, we have this also a paper about how uh, use of ointment, antibiotic ointment actually uh, had uh, incidence of uh, tasks in numerous patients. And then they saw these ointment bubbles on the lens and then they tested the ointment and they found that the cause was from the uh, ophthalmic ointment. 
So it could actually range from different reasons. Now, these are numerous large papers published over the last decade. And the causes would range from, as you can see in the last column, because of the source from the IOL to contamination of autoclave reservoirs. So the autoclave process, if you know, it's not accurate, or this contamination of the ultrasonic cleaner or the autoclave itself, that could be a reason. From the BSS, from the Trepan blue, from the over the uh, OVD, intracameral gentamicin, ET, or any of this could basically be the cause for TAS. There has been uh, you know, a lot of interest in TAS after this main publication in 2005. Now, this is a, a publication from the US where seven ophthalmic surgical centers had reported TAS, a total of 112 patients. You know, after this is when uh, both the ACRS uh, took a lot of effort uh, and the AO took a lot of effort to have a TAS registry and TAS committee. In that uh, a cluster of TAS, the reason was said to be from the PSS, so the, the specific uh, uh, component was cytosol, which AMO had manufactured. And this was the reason why so many patients had TAS. And once this was identified and withdrawn, this uh, outbreak terminated. Another reason could also be the water. The reason I'm sharing these different uh, reports is that you know anything could be there. So once you're doing an uh, investigation, one has to think of every aspect. Now, this report basically had an outbreak in 2002 where three surgeons had, uh, had this uh, cluster of tags and they realized that the actual reason was in the autoclave steam, there was a higher sulfate component. And this is because the water which was being you know, provided by the city corporation, the cleaning process had changed in the recent past. And that is the reason why the water had more sulfate because the water was not softened enough. And this obviously uh, kind of was a, a hindrance and there was a problem with the autoclave process and there was an endotoxin uh, on the um, instrument and there was TAS as well. So sterilization and, and detergents are something which uh, can have been proven in the past to very often cause uh, TAS. And uh, in most instances, they only are, you know, they, they, they even last uh, until temperature goes beyond 140 degrees centigrade. Whereas our autoclave, most often it is at 121 degrees. So most often these enzymes or detergents are still there. And that is what could be a reason why when we use these enzymes, there's a higher incidence of TAS as well. So it's important to use you know, the right water source and uh, uh, to avoid uh, enzymes as much as possible uh, to prevent this incidence. Now, in terms of instrument cleaning, there's a very interesting paper uh, from, again, in Jason Harris, which looked at the, the cause for the tag, which was linked to instrument cleaning in two periods of time, 2007 to 9 and 2009 to 2011. And everything from in, you know, in inadequate flushing of uh, instruments to enzymatic cleaners to not uh, you know, cleaning the reusable cannulas well, or touching the IOL surface, so everything was listed, and some things were you know, more frequent in the recent area. For example, they found reduction in use of tap water in the second phase. Uh, that was only 7%, but more patients now had touched by touching the IOL or patient contact areas with the glove hands, or there was poor instrument maintenance, autoclave residue, instrument milk, rust particles, lint, etc. So this is what was the result of the observation made by this group to the different sites uh, at these two different time points. So any, everything in detail has to be checked to prevent this kind of an outbreak. OVDs also could be a source, especially if you're using the cannulas again, the FACO tips, IA tips, different cannulas. This can actually cause the uh, material to cause the task and it's flushed inside the eye. So it's very important again that in between surgeries as well, not just end of the day, but in between cases as well, to flush all these uh, instruments which have the cannula. So you want to flush them and then send them out for a flash or a short cycle sterilization. Now, gram negative endotoxin is linked to uh, uh, outbreak of TAS, and this has been proved uh, in the previous uh, uh, outbreaks as well. 
And uh, this especially happens during sterilization because you know you find that water baths or ultrasound baths can harbor the gram negative bacteria. And once these bacteria go through the sterilization process, the autoclave process, the bacteria is destroyed. But what does remain is the bacteria cell wall. And this cell wall has the endotoxin, which is basically heat stable lipopolysaccharide. So even in spite of that temperature, the endotoxin does remain. So in comparison to an exotoxin, which is secreted by a viable microscope, a uh, viable uh, microbe, endotoxin is from the bacterial cell wall. The architecture itself contributes to it. So and this is heat uh, stable. So in spite of high temperature, this does not get denatured. And uh, the only good thing is the toxicity could be variable. That's why we don't have very severe pictures. Most of the time, this is a self-limiting uh, condition. Uh, that's a good aspect of uh, TAS. And chemical composition also prohibits the molecular modification of endotoxins. Now, the endotoxin uh, uh, is tested by the manufacturer for different reagents like VSS or interoculins, etc. Earlier, the recommended EU limit was about less than or equal to 0.5, e less than no, EU per device. It was modified in 2014 by the uh, FDA and you know, DCGI, etc., to be less than 0.2. So this is the new norm. So today, any device has to, you know, will pass the endotoxin test only if it is less than 0.2. And this was apply, uh, applied to IOLs, iris reconstruction lenses, capsule retention rings, etc. So coming to IOLs, which probably is a, you know, a matter of concern with the recent uh, outbreak which we had in our country. So IOLs has not been new. We have had you know, the numerous papers in the in the you know, you know in, the, uh, in the past which have published about TAS, which was linked to the IOLs being the source of the uh, contamination. So the IOLs, so one major paper is of 251 ice, which had the FOIA hydrophobic acrylic IOL. And they said it was probably because of the IOL contamination with aluminium. Another paper also was there in similar time again from Japan, which also says aluminum coating could be the reason. The other uh, hydrophobic acrylic IOL is the restore toric lenses and restore lenses. Again, 147 cases were reported, again from authors in Japan. And here again, this is when you had residual aluminum, these patients had a task like picture. And hydrophilic lenses also could, uh, you know, cause tasks. And a couple of papers are there with hydrophilic uh, IOs as well. Some of it, the cause is not known clearly, you know, why there was tasks with this specific lens. But this paper, which was published in 2000, they used memory lens. And they said the residual polishing compound on the memory lens was responsible for the post-op inflammation. So some of these manufacturers, you know, actually do a detailed analysis and they know the cause, or some of them, may not know the cause. So what is important to prevent is to have a thorough review of the protocols and to ensure we adhere you know, very strict, uh, strictly to the uh, CSST protocol. This is most critical to prevent uh, uh, a, a cluster of tasks. Uh, there are a couple of you know, good papers, but this is one paper which was published in 2011 from the Pondicherry Arvindai Hospital Group which talks about protocols for determining the etiology of TAS. So this space, you know, in case one does have uh, TAS, then this is what you would want to look at. You would like to review the cleaning protocols, review the procedure for each surgeon, including, you know, what intracamera, what, what happened inside the eye. So everything has to be relooked. Like I said, there's also been report of uh, antibiotic ointment because there could be some ingress of, you know, of any surface, uh, drugs and medications as well. The water supply, the nursing and technical staff, uh, is that a cause of concern? Ventilation system, uh, bacterial culturing from the OVD, BSS and sterilizer, in the toxin biofilm sampling. So all of this has to be tested if there is a cluster of TAS. Now this other paper by, again published recently in BMC Ophthalmology, gives an algorithm for prevention and investigation of TAS. So basically once there is a task case, one will have to see if it is just one sporadic case, then I think, you no, know, we normally will just wait to see. But if you're seeing a cluster, you know, more than one case, two or three cases in a short period of time by, you know, or, or by different surgeons using the same facility, 
uh, then one has to be careful. Now, how do we know that more people have? First of all, you'll have to share information with other, so especially in the same, using the same OT or same hospital, share with them after they're seeing the same problem and have a log of you know what cases have that. So you have to know everything from which patients, what was the solution used, what was the batch number, what was the, you know, everything which went inside the eye has to be documented and check for any changes in the protocol. So this is typically what you say. There have been some new staff who had a different way of flushing out the cannula or the water source may be a problem. Or, you know, so you'll have to really go to the depth to see has there been any change to the materials used or procedures followed which caused a change in the OR environment? And once you kind of understand what the cause is, uh, then you know you can set it right. But if you don't, then you may even have to consider shutting down the OR facility. Or if you find that there is a problem in one specific batch of like, like you saw a batch of IOLs or bases, the best thing is to kind of stop using that specific a brand of consumable until we understand what the cause is. Uh, try using a new batch of uh, BSS or viscoelastic, so wherever we think the problem could be there, and then uh, continue to investigate. Now, in case you find that with all the changes, things are better, then you can resume your surgeries with a small number. But if you're not able to control, I think it's good for you to put as much energy as you can in trying to find the cause for it. Now, when you're having a patient with TAS, the first thing is to, like I said, always be doubly sure that it's not endophthalmitis. If it's culture negative, then you can think of TAS. It doesn't have to be, you can, all, you can still have culture negative endophthalmitis as well. But if it is only anti-segment with hypopion and just cells you know, responding to steroids, then it is more in favor of TAS. But, uh, you know, and then if you're able to find some reason, it's also good to share it with the TAS registry so others in the area may also be a little bit more careful. So finally, uh, prevention is better than cure. So team effort is critical, written down protocols. All should be well versed with the norms and document and review the data periodically. And following the rules is also important to prevent any, to prevent any incidents of deaths. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. That was an extensive talk covering, I think, every aspect of TAS. Now, just to compare it with end of telmitis and differentiate it with it, yeah. I would like to invite uh, Dr. Sopnil Parchan, sir, uh, to deliver his talk on cluster end of telmitis and managing it medically. Thank you, uh, Dr. Deepanshu. Can you see my slides? Yes, sir. You can. Yeah. So, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Dipanshu and UC group for inviting me for this webinar. So uh, basically we all ophthalmologists are talking on, are walking on a very thin rope and any error from our part or from external influence can land up in a big problem. So uh, basically uh, I am working in a tertiary eye care institute and uh, we had few uh, instances where uh, we manage few of the cluster end of thalmitis which happened around our region and were referred to us. So we could publish this uh, paper in IGO in 2020 where we have reported six clusters of uh, happening due to multi-drug resistant pseudomonas. So basically, uh, what is cluster end of thalmitis? Basically, cluster end of thalmitis is occurrence of end of thalmitis much higher than the local incidence pattern or occurrence of two or more cases of infection at a time or occurrence of repeated post-operative infection under similar circumstances with same surgeon, same staff or same OR. This means that uh, it is not always necessary that cluster end of thalmitis will always happen on a single day. You might have one case today, maybe after a week you have another case and our third week, you have another case. So this is also a cluster end of thalmitis. So you have to think in terms of cluster in such situation. So once uh, you know that you are dealing with a cluster end of thalmitis, what are the immediate measures you need to take? So first of all, you take out the list of the patients who were operated on that particular day or on that particular uh, time frame, and you contact all the patients 
and ask for specific symptoms like redness, pain, a recent onset of uh, blurring of vision and ask them to schedule a follow-up visit immediately. And this should be uh, like a courtesy call to a patient rather than as an alarm call. Uh, then second is uh, you have to uh, postpone all the operative procedures till further order and uh, you need you might have to seal your operation theater till there is further clearance all the residual material drugs devices which you have used during surgery should be kept aside for analysis and if the drugs are discarded like iols so you can keep the aisles of the same batch for analysis. Uh, then what all authorities you should in, uh, inform? So first of all, you need to inform your uh, director of the hospital, then you need to mobilize the retina team and you need to inform the management. Then you need to talk to your colleague ophthalmologist to be very vigilant when they are seeing the patient like they should be vigilant in say, seeing the cells, flare, fibrin, vitreous cells, so their antenna should be high in picking up this subtle findings. Then staff and registration counter should be informed because they are the first people who would encounter this patient. So they should uh, be very vigilant about the symptoms. Like if patient is complaining of redness or pain, so they should fast track those, those patients and make sure that they are seen early by the concerned ophthalmologist. Then a reception person should also be informed because there would be a lot of phone calls which would be coming from patients, relative, or maybe for instance, media people. So they should be polite and uh, they should tackle the situation uh, decently. Then uh, the hospital infection team, which constitutes the microbiologist and sterilization department should be informed. And apart from this state and district authorities, state ophthalmologic uh, society and AIA should be informed. Uh, we should also keep a lawyer of institute or a legal cell in the loop. So uh, documents which need to be kept ready uh, for analysis is the case file of patient, which include detailed examination findings, plan, uh, investigations like if uh, sugars, blood pressure, systemic evaluation, that should be kept uh, aside. Then surgical register of OR that includes the detail of patients, the sequence in which they are operated, the OT in which they were operated, number of patients operated, and the surgeons and assistant details also should be kept aside. Then autoclaving register, which includes the lot number, then uh, uh, for instance is the uh, 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 marker, they should be properly kept. The culture report swab details of the OT complex should also be kept. Uh, AC maintenance register, cleaning and fumigation register, batch numbers and details from the hospital stores of especially consumables like IOL, RL, they also should be kept aside. Uh, details of the lens, FACO tubings and all the records re related to the sterilization and maintenance also should be kept for analysis. So once you have this cluster endophthalmitis, uh, first and foremost is to treat the patient who have uh, unfortunately uh, landed up with endophthalmitis and to salvage the best possible vision. Then second thing is to identify the source of the infection to prevent the another outbreak. And lastly is to build the social, uh, psychosocial confidence in both the caregiver and the care seeker. So coming to the treatment part, uh, treating cluster endophthalmitis is on the same lines uh, on the endophthalmitis vitrectomy study. Uh, but nowadays, we are more aggressive in this uh, tre uh, treating these cases with more vitrectomy. Uh, vitrectomy actually help us to debulk most of the vitreous and it also help us to uh, obtain an adequate sample for microbiology purpose, which is further sent for uh, microbiology. Uh, coming to the outcome, the outcome actually depends upon the speed of how fast do we treat those uh, patients uh, and how extensive we can do possibility of doing a good vitrectomy and lastly the susceptibility of infecting uh, microorganism. Uh, most of the published literature mentions 
two important factors which are responsible for poor visual outcome. First is uh, involvement of the cornea. If cornea is getting involved, then the outcome is poor. And secondly is the presence of multi-drug resistance bacteria. So if I have to pick up which is more problematic, then it is a multi-drug resistance bacteria which is causing endophthalmitis. So uh, this is the uh, uh, graph which was uh, taken by uh, from this Joseph et al. publication from I. So in this, we can see uh, the pattern of resistance which is being developed over a period of uh, 10 years. So in 2005, if we see the septazidine, now the intravitreal antibiotics which are used for treatment of endophthalmitis most commonly is vancomycin and septazidine. So if you see septazidine, so in 2005, almost 30% of the uh, isolates were resistant, but it has increased to around 60 to 70% in 2015. So the septazidine uh, is less effective in today's scenario considering the resistant pattern. Similarly, this is the table which was uh, taken from our publication. So if you can uh, see that uh, this is regarding pseudomonas. So around 67% of the pseudomonas isolates were resistant to um, uh, amikacin and around 90 or more than 90% of the isolates were resistant to gentamicin, dobramycin, ciprofloxacin, getifloxacin, ofloxacin and almost all were resistant to moxifloxacin and only the antibiotics which were effective were imipenem, meropenem, piperazil and clos uh, uh, and uh, Colistin. So uh, the thought is that uh, most of the uh, cluster endophthalmitis are basically uh, caused because of gram negative organism. So you, if you happen to encounter cluster endophthalmitis, then uh, it would be a thought that rather than giving ceftazidime, you can uh, uh, give the patient intravitreal imipenem or meropenem or piperalizim or close, um, colistin. Uh, then coming to the source of infection, it could be anything. It could be surgical instruments, irrigating fluid, intraocular lens, or the sur uh, surgical environment. Uh, and it is important to establish what exactly is the cause of infection, which we, which we can do by molecular mi microbiological methods, which include PCR and rapid assay. Uh, as per Royal College of Ophthalmology UK, once uh, cluster endophthalmitis is encountered, so we need to formulate a team which include physician, microbiologist and operating nurse. And uh, the, all the records should be analyzed by this team. And they have mentioned a color coding. So uh, if we have green alert, green alert means one case of endophthalmitis or one in 100 cases or two in 600 cases of uh, uh, operated patient, then we should uh, we should be vigilant, very careful uh, in operating uh, further cases. And we need to close the operation theater if there is amble color or red color. Amble color is one case in 75 cases or two cases in 300 to 500 cases or three cases in 700 to 800 cases or red is two cases in less than 200 cases, three cases in less than 600 cases, and four cases in less than 800 cases. So if you have amber or red alert, then you need to close your OR. Then lastly is the psychosocial aspect. Since this patient has landed up with uh, endophthalmitis, so there is a lot of mental and physical trauma for them as well as their family. We need to understand that. And secondly is the surgeon, operating surgeon, also is under a lot of stress. So he had to maintain a dignified calm and uh, he need to uh, tide over this crisis which has happened. So uh, patient and relative should be counseled regarding the diagnosis, management and prognosis in a reassuring way. That is, uh, they need to be taken into confidence that best possible treatment is being done to, uh, to uh, save whatever vision we can. And uh, guarded visual prognosis should not be hidden and it should be clearly discussed and they should also be informed about the multiple, uh, multiple operative procedure that might be required or uh, the long term follow up which is must in these patients. Then lastly is the media. 
so uh, it is uh, a good idea that a senior person from the hospital management having a fair medical knowledge should correspond to with the media and all the questions should be answered openly and wisely and a question regarding the prognosis outcome of the cases should be in reassuring way and not to lose temper while addressing the uh, media and they should be given a proper time rather than entering entertaining them in any time and uh, lastly is not to uh, do a blame game and it should not be fault finding of the surgeon so what should we do firstly is when uh, this patient uh, when you have encountered cluster and of thalamitis you should designate a special area where this infected patient uh, should stay or sit or and probably a different ward where they should be admitted which will be, should be away from a clean uh, other ward which has a clean cases and a person from a hospital management can be made a coordinator so that they can talk to the patient relative address their problem counsel them uh, and then a senior most doctor heading the team should talk to the patient and relate uh, relative regarding the visual outcome prognosis and procedures and from among the team of doctor only one doctor should be assigned to interact the media and uh, lastly uh, the less we talk with the media the better it is and it should be to the point the things which we should avoid is we should not lose cool we need to understand it is both psychological and mentally disturbing for the patient and relative as i said that never we should uh, play a blame game uh, say third thing is we should not uh, have a loose talk while examining the patient or while discussing with the colleagues uh, never compare the outcome of two patients in front of the relative or media and it is better that we avoid uh, we avoid the uh, questions related to outcome or visual outcome and uh, never avoid the media completely because they might be a barrier bridging barrier between us and authority or patients so uh, lastly life isn't meant to be easy it's meant to be lived sometimes happy other times rough but with every ups and downs you learn lesson that makes you strong thank you thank you for your patient hearing thank you very much sir it was an elaborate talk uh, right from covering from documentation managing patient in the opd surgical management and also how to manage hospital and media uh, now uh, i would like to invite uh, anand deshpande sir to give us an overview on how to legally manage these situations if one faces it yes good evening everybody now whatever talk was given was the clinical management of the patients of the task or the end of the matters but our things are totally different in our things we are facing the consequences of what has happened to clinically and uh, so the things are totally different all the things depends upon the outcome of the result of your treatment and we have to face for that about me everything is already been thing the legal matter arising in the tas and cluster end of thalamitis the are different the tas is not that severe as end of thalamitis which may cause the uh, can i make it a little small so that it will not disturb uh, the side of images no sir you can't do it you uh, okay okay you can't do it uh the tas is not the severe as end of thalamitis which may cause the total loss of vision but uh this i can do it i think uh yeah you can do like this yeah it is visible and good enough but uh, sure, you have to be moving the you slide you are happy with previous or this one i think one one corner gets blocked for you right that is yeah. Yeah. one yeah. corner of slide gets blocked right yeah 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 so so this is also fine i think this is also fine no okay okay, okay. okay. right so uh, the 
but task may not be that much severe. So the legal uh, scenario changes according to the severity in loss of vision. Cluster episode draws more legal liability than the sporadic one. Because whenever there are more uh, infections in the same hospital and uh, same place, there, there are more uh, outcomes are different. The legal matter yeah, arising in the legal liability changes also according to the type of the hospital as solo hospital, trust or corporate hospital or government hospital. As we have discussed up till now, is majority a big hospital, either a corporate or a trust or a big hospital where team of doctors are there. But in many places where the solo practitioner, he is the team and he is the person who has to face everything. Uh, if the patient or uh, patients are aggrieved, then they may go to consumer forum, civil uh, suit in civil court. They will never go to there because the results are to their uh, grandchildren's. The criminal case, they may go, but they don't get any benefits. So they prefer consumer forums than the criminal case. Medical Council of India and state medical councils also they can go. And uh, But there is also no benefit of the patient except the revenge. But they go at this place to get some clue or some decision by them, which can be used in the consumer forum. So this is interdependent also. Or sometimes to minister, member of parliament, or assembly, director of deputy, director of medical or health services also, they get and they put the inquiry on the concerned doctor. Under Consumer Protection Act, the doctor or hospital is sued for negligence and not for complication. The, though both the things are complication, ta uh, TAS is also a complication and uh, cluster infection, or the end of thalmitis is also a uh, complication. So for that, it is never sued in the consumer court, but which are mentioned in the textbooks uh, or in the uh, index journals, TAS and end of thalmitis are mentioned as complications. So for these purposes, they cannot be, doctor cannot be sued in the consumer court, but he is sued for the not knowing or taking the action for that, that is a negligence. Supreme Court says that the doctor will not be held responsible under negligence if the treatment is at per the standard textbooks and or accepted professional practice and still the patient suffers or loses the injury. Patient may lose the vision, patient may lose the eye, still doctor cannot be blamed if the treatment is as per the standard textbooks or merely because the complication has occurred during the surgery, even if the complication happens and uh, uh, he is not blamed. So TAS or uh, end up thalmitis or cluster infection, whatever happens, doctor cannot be blamed for that uh, complication. But doctor is blamed. Complication, it was not a negligence. There is a blurred line between complication and negligence. What to call the complication and what to call the negligence is a very blurred line. The duty of the medical legal expert is to show the, it that honorable judge. And this is the where the medical legal expert is required. Because the medical legal expert has to show to the judge that this is the complication and not the negligence of the doctor which has caused the loss to the patient. And if the judge is satisfied, doctor is saved. But not understanding the complication or not taking the steps for rectifying it or not referring the patient to higher center may be taken as negligence. So you have to understand if you are anti the segment for the doctor, you have to understand there is a task or there is a end of thalmitis or there is a cluster and you immediately should refer to a VR surgeon, higher center or whatever is higher center to you. But referring the patient only on phone is not sufficient because that doesn't create any document. And the course runs on document, document, and documents only, and not your uh, the efforts that you have taken for the patient. 
because they are not visible to the court so you should refer the patient with black and white or email and have a received signature of the patient or you send a email which becomes the document pre, uh, pre operative investigations proper uh, directions to the patient and follow up notes here also priya because you are ophthalmologist and you cannot judge whole body of the patient so you are also uh, said that you are negligent there for judging uh, 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 the patient as fit for surgery better to have a fitness from a md physician and that portion is over so diabetes blood pressure and all the things which are happening the, uh, these things uh, you will be saved out of that when there were cluster infection episode happens doctor is blamed is it correct no because the cluster infection cannot take place because of surgery as the subsequent surgery cannot meet the same complication even if one had in the first surgery so cluster infection is something different that is not the fault of the doctor but something else the supporting system support and things are there but the task or cluster infection is because of infection or reaction to some intra cameral source beyond the control of a surgeon he may be solo or he may be in corporate if he is in the corporate he, he is totally beyond the control because he cannot concentrate or control other things rather than the surgery and for that surgeon cannot be blamed and immediate action should not be taken against the surgeon and so i have uh, proved it in many cluster infections which has faced by many hospitals in india uh, the precautions to be taken by the ophthalmologist to avoid the claim of negligence in tas or endophthalmitis direct the complication in, uh, in the time uh, detect the complication in time note it down treat it vigorously and keep the record so we are very poor in keeping the record so we should keep the well record notes very well written on that if patient uh, is diabetic take the opinion of the physician if you are a general ophthalmologist refer the patient to a vr surgeon giving all details of the patient and with black and white record not only on phone refer the patient with a referral letter in duplicate and do not to take received signature of the patient on your document that you have taken the proper action in proper time and that saves you in the court so many times it is never done by the doctors uh, what are the sources of tas or cluster infection hospital source i have not to speak anything because so many clinicians before me both the clinicians has told it uh, material source also is like quite uh, been discussed the then why the surgeon is blamed when the he is doing the work with social work attitude and without uh, his any fault so why he should be um, refer why he should be blamed under consumer protection act civil liability uh, for negligence in solo practice it is the responsibility as he is the owner of the hospital so these two liabilities are legal liabilities are quite a different in consumer protection act solo practitioner and a corporate hospital trust hospital government hospital or it is a responsibility of that hospital whereas the responsibility in solo practice it is the responsibility of the doctor because he is the owner of that hospital the supreme court says the patient once they are admitted to such hospitals it is the responsibility to satisfy that all possible care was taken and no negligence was involved in attending the patient in fact it is the hospital who engages the treating doctor therefore it is his responsibility therefore no individual doctor is liable and can be held jointly or severely liable even visiting doctors or consulting doctors in private hospitals remember in private hospitals if you are having your hospital and somebody is coming and operating you are responsible and not he cannot be held liable the consumer does not avail services of such doctor individually by paying fees or consideration to these doctors directly because what happens 
in Consumer Protection Act, it is clearly seen, so told, whosoever gives the fees is the consumer and whosoever receives the money is the service provider. In big hospitals, corporate trusts or such hospitals, the fees is paid to the hospital and not to the doctor. It will go to the doctor in the form of share or payment or whatever it may be, but the patient is not paying the fees directly to the doctor. So he cannot be a consumer of that doctor, but the doctor is giving his services to the hospital. So hospital is taking the services. So in between, this is a triangle. So patient cannot sue directly. And even if he sue directly, this uh, uh, the decision of the Supreme Court and National Forum, he can be saved immediately. The consumer does not avail services of such doctors individually by paying fees or consideration to those doctors directly. So, but in criminal liability of negligence, doctor and hospital both are responsible irrespective of which type of the hospital it is. But if the patient goes to the criminal case or files a FIR, he is totally responsible. Patient can send a legal notice as patient himself or through advocate or civil court, consumer court, MCI or state medical council, police station, criminal court ally, uh, called as warrant or other agencies as health services, corporate ETC. I ophthalmologist should take the steps. He will not refuse the notice as even if you refuse, it will be taken as you are being informed. So never, never refuse the notice. Take the notice, take the cognizance of the notice. It is not mandatory to answer the notice of a patient or the advocate. You can keep mum for those notices. Other notices, answer with the help of advocate or a medical legal consultant. Have a intimate insurance with good coverage limit and a medical legal consultant as advisor to keep yourself cool. Then don't become panic even if you receive a notice. So whenever you are having a medical legal consultant and insurance, you are very much, you should remain cool and all the things will be there looked after by them. When you receive a notice from a consumer court, you have to give written statement in the consumer court. To face and defend better way, it is given with the help of medical legal consultant. It becomes more effective because he has knowledge of law and medical. He has uh, he can represent a doctor better way than a normal advocate and so can win the case. He can help for maintaining the medical legal records, which helps in the court to win the case. So it is very important. Normal advocate doesn't know medical terminologies, doesn't have any knowledge. So he doesn't understand what is to be represented from the doctor. And hence, the, uh, the judge cannot be convinced. And if the judge is not convinced, the result cannot be on your side. So the basis of protections are facts. Facts means your record whatever things has happened and what is uh, uh, precautions you are taken. Circumstances, in what uh, stage the patient came as an emergency or a regular patient or a follow-up patient or a referred patient. Supportive documents, so uh, your investigations, physical fitness reports, anesthetic reports, records that you are maintained and uh, clinical references will definitely help. That is our duty to put the clinical references when the case is there and case loss. That is our responsibility to put the case laws also, which will favor the doctors. The Supreme Court says, for it is held that for every mishap or hell uh, during the medical treatment, the medical man cannot be proceeded against for punishment. The medical man is not an insurer. He does not warrant successful of the treatment or cure of the patient. Entity insurance policies should be taken, as I said, for doctors and hospital staff separately because the case may be put on the hospital only or the doctor only. If the uh, hospital is different from the doctor's ownership, then the uh, doctor's policy will not be useful for the hospital. So it should be taken separately. And for everything, what is required is your record and your representation to the court
I think there is a network issue with sir at the sir end. Hello. But network issue came at the proper time. I think it has already finished. <laughs> has given us essentially uh, yeah. all the do's and don'ts which one medical clinician uh, should follow. Uh, now I would like to invite our panelist, uh, Dr. Prakash Marathi sir and Manoj Mathur sir, and all the speakers. Uh, the, as in the platform is open for discussion. So would you like to give us any yeah. input, sir? Yes. Uh, I think it was fantastic presentation by the presenters, uh, Dr. Deshpande sir, Dr. Haripriya ma'am and Dr. Swapnil sir. Uh, my uh, important question is the liar, the doctor and the medical legal expert who is the liar. Uh, this is my straight question to Dr. Ranantha Deshpande sir. I think a uh, liar can present in the court of law the case. The medical legal expert who is practicing as doctor I don't think he can present the case in the court of law. I think if at all he want to present the case, he should not be a practicing doctor. What is your opinion, sir? Yes, sir. It is true. The both registration cannot be had. MMC, Maharashtra Medical Council or All India Medical Council registration and Bar Council registration cannot be had simultaneously. So a practicing doctor can be a medical legal consultant. He can prepare everything as I am doing. So I am having uh, the law knowledge, management knowledge, and the medical knowledge. So I prepare everything and put the everything in the hands of the uh, normal advocate who represents in the court. In consumer courts, advocate has not to speak a single word. He has to put only the documents, documents, and documents. He has not to open even his mouth. So it is very easy to conduct a case of in the consumer case uh, for a medical legal consultant who is practicing as a uh, medical person. But in criminal cases, the advocate has to ask so many questions, so many things, and that for his knowledge should be there. For those persons also, we prepare probable questions for to be answered and probable questions which can be answered by opposite party. And we give the answers to the our doctors so that they are not fumbled. And this can be done by the advocate who is standing in the court. In the MCI also, Medical Council of India, or um, um, uh, any state council or um, uh, inquiry that is only documentary evidences and you, you can prepare this and give to the uh, concerned you know, doctor they represent so only the thing is in criminal cases there is a difficulty for a doctor practicing as a doctor not having registration with the bar council so in short, uh, the person who is BSC LLB or BA LLB can present in the court of law. Dr. Deshpande, who is ophthalmologist and practicing as ophthalmologist, cannot represent in court of law. But if at all Dr. Deshpande, sir, present the case in the court of law, he should surrender his MMC or MCI registration. Correct? Apart from that. that. Apart yeah. from that, that is the law only, only for the civil and criminal courts. It is not for the consumer forum. It is not for all the forums, not in the MMC also. So for regular courts, which are having the bar council, that are only the places where one cannot appear and without uh, the registration. Just in addition, uh, even at uh, consumer forum, not only advocate, not only a doctor, but even the normal person can present. Am I right? Yeah, yeah that is true. Even routine the person, person doctor can himself yeah. can represent his case. A routine person who is not a doctor, not a lawyer can present yeah. his or her own case. Yeah, that's uh, my next question is to Dr. Haripriya, ma'am. Hello, ma'am. Uh, can you unmute? Yes, sir. Hello, sir. Uh, your uh, presentation was fantastic. Now, as surgeon, we have been doing our job in a perfect way, perfect surgery, perfect results. But unfortunately, when it is a part of some manufacturer, maybe some consumable, maybe some IOL, you really do not know. And I don't think there is any remedy to prevent TAS or endophthalmitis. But still, uh, you have tried to cover in your uh, lecture, in your talk, but how one can really, really prevent? I think it is very difficult. What's your opinion? No, it, it is difficult, sir, but it is not uh, impossible. So, of course, I think once the team has to be very well, uh, they should understand the importance of 
checking everything. You know, one is two things. One, the, the processes and protocols followed in the theater, uh, all of which the staff is responsible for. So that everything has to be documented. Whatever is being done has to, you have to have the indicators, class one, class five, whatever, you know, make sure that the whole process is followed well. Uh, you get the water from the right source. So all that has to be done. Is the overhead tank cleaning done every month? Is the autoclave being serviced every six months? So one, if we have all of this itself, you know, half the problem could be solved. So, now coming to consumables, I think it may be difficult, but if it is going to be a cluster problem, so some small things like for us, one, we try to work with more you know, regular vendors whom we can trust. That is one thing. And have two vendors at least because you don't want to be suddenly without any consumables. The other thing is to also check, like, you know, for using BSS or something, one bottle per batch, we check the culture and the pH for BSS, so the scholastic and those consumables. And we have it documented. So any new batch of drug we use, we like to have it documented. So again, you know, the staff have to be aware of the importance of checking for the drug expiry and you know, checking for the bottle to see any fluid, you know, if any particle is seen in the fluid. So all of this is a part of training and it's not a one-time job. It's a constant job and which you know also involves a lot of documentation. But if something goes wrong, then we will at least know that you know, what happened because we have a good documentation process in place. But like this sporadic incidents which happened recently, there was the problem that was the fault in IOL. I think uh, we cannot do anything for that. We right? cannot do anything. But the good thing is, see, the doctor who had this whole thing, you know, identified was because she made sure she checked everything. So she didn't stop and say, so you have to go back and see, you know, what is it? Is it look at the same? Is it the BSS? Is it the same batch? Or the scholastic? Or anything which goes inside the eye. So you have to find the root cause. Uh, otherwise, this can continue and you'll lose your sleep. You know, imagine doing surgery and not, not knowing next day will the patient do well? Will the patient be happy? You can't operate with a peace of mind. So one cannot function like that. So when something like this happens, we'll have to go to the depth to understand what happens. And once we know, it's very easy. You just have to stop using that consumable until it has been rectified by the company. Uh, one of the point is keep this nice. One important point, madam, you said about aluminum and IOL coming together. Exactly. Little bit explanation from your side. No, I think there, whatever the, the papers which have been published for hydrophobic IOLs, I think there they say when the IOLs are, uh, you know, polished, there is a lot more than accepted level of aluminum. And that was the cause for those couple of papers which had it. Now, in the recent problem which we had now with the hydrophilic, I think it's a different problem. Hydrophobic actually, uh, you know, you won't have this kind of issue with endotoxic. But this is an issue because hydrophilic lenses come in the water, in the fluid. And that is why the risk of, you know, having a toxicity because of uh, high EU levels. So that is, this is a different problem that we are facing here. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Perfect. Uh, I think I'd like to finish my question. One question and then uh, I'll hand over yes, to other yes. presenters. Uh, Dr. Swapnil, you being the VR surgeon, most of these complicated cases of uh, end of and toss, they come to you. And from medical legal point of view, uh, the answer given to uh, the patients and relatives from your side, what is the balancing act? Do you want to protect your colleagues or uh, do you want to state where tell you to, to your patients and relatives? Uh, what, are, what are your views? How do you deal with such patients and relatives? So firstly, uh... The important thing is not to blame your colleague because it can happen anywhere. It can happen after VR surgery also. So like we have already discussed, there are many things which can cause endophthalmitis. It is not a surgeon uh, which is responsible actually for endophthalmitis. There can be surrounding atmosphere, OT atmosphere or consumables. So uh, first thing is not to blame the surgeon. And secondly is uh, it can be uh, patient needs to be counseled about the situation what he is in like the severity of the case uh, what treatment you are giving you need to take him in, uh, in uh, what you I mean to say is you need to counsel that you are doing the best possible treatment for the patient and sometimes things are not in your hand but whatever is you are able to do you are doing that thing 
I think we need to strike a balance here, Dr. Marathe sir. Like uh, we, you just can't keep things out of uh, the patient's purview. You have to tell him the real cause at the same time trying to protect your colleague saying that this can happen in the best hands. So I think that is the line we need to adopt. Correct, correct. Dipans, you can take over. Otherwise also, I, this can be said that this is not the complication and the doctor has not concerned with this complication. Other factors are working in that and this has happened. So this is not the fault of the doctor, but there is something else which is causing this. So the both are safe. Uh, Dipansho, do you want to ask anything? Uh, I have a you question. want me to continue? Yeah. Uh, can I ask? Uh, can I ask, sir? Of course, of course. Um, Ma'am, I have a question, like very basic question. So since the defect was found to be in IOL in this recent episode of cluster task, so can the doctor be sued for this? And if doctor gets sued, how do we proceed with that? If the if, if, we have to ask uh, Dr. Radesh Pandey, he can yeah. ask. A patient generally sues to the doctor or the hospital, but the doctor has to bring this evidence that because of this has happened and he should be able to prove in the court that there is no fault of the doctor technique or doctor negligence. It is the complication happened because of this product and the product is not to the mark or is something is having some problem and because of that you have uh, so now the doctor can sue to the company for the sake of patient and can uh, have compensation to the patient through the company and doctor will be saved but the patient will definitely sue to the doctor and hospital only but he has to prove that and, and direct the patient to sue the company for that because the fault is there and there the, the witness of the doctor helps the patient in getting the damages. Madam, one thing, has the company accepted that the IOL is responsible? Because I in the court of law, it is difficult. Like the company may say, my product is good. Yes, yes, I don't think it has been, I don't think it has been proven as of now, but I think been knowing from so many doctors who have reported that they are not seeing it once they stopped using those specific lenses or those patches, it's probably an indication that that was the cause, because that is what the ophthalmologists who were using it, who had reported that point in time, now when they stop it, they don't see it anymore, so that probably is an indication that, that it could be the cause. But ma'am, the interim report which IOS recently released, uh, I think none of the uh, samples, they found any endotoxins or it was below the levels which it should be. So does that make any difference? Like I said, no, it's very difficult. You know, we don't know how many, what was tested. What, so I mean, it's very difficult. Endotoxin testing actually itself is, when they say, it's very vague. You know, it depends upon how it is being tested, which labs and all. But uh, so we'll have to look, wait for the final results, probably. Uh, uh, is there, sir, one question is there in the uh, survey. Uh, Dr. Kuzaima Patwala has asked from MP that, is there any role of preoperative topical antibiotics in preventing these complications? So, topical antibiotics are used very commonly, but there is not much evidence in the literature of topical antibiotics actually helping. What has been proven to be most effective is use of COVID or iodine. That is what has, uh, you know, established evidence. Uh, of course, there are other papers in intracameral moxiprotoxin, etc. But I think most of us, most of them always do use topical. It can be helpful for taking care of, you know, any organisms in the uh, adnexa, you know, the, you know, the lid or lashes or something. All of that could also be, you know, taken care of if you use topical antibiotics. Right. Is betadine, betadine cleaning helpful? Very important, sir. Critical. It's very important to use betadine. That, that's the only one which has uh, evidence there that, that it helps to prevent an ophthalmitis. Uh, Dipanshu, if you have any question or otherwise I'll... Uh, you can ask, sir. Please go ahead. Uh, in recent... Uh, 
recently AIS had asked for those samples of IOLs and those consumables, which was supposed to be faulty. And few samples have reached to AIS. One important thing is that those were sent to one laboratory and probably that laboratory was uh, competitors of those uh, IOL business people. They didn't believe it. Even uh, they said that IOL manufacturing company that their lab said that there was no fault, but uh, other labs said maybe something was faulty. Now they are trying to send those samples to neutral lab, which is not related to any of the companies and no bias reports will be coming from that. Uh, the next thing is now uh, medical legal point of view. In the COVID era, basically, uh, especially to Dr. Deshpande sir, I am asking this question. In COVID era, when there was no protocol to treat the patients, like it was just the life-saving treatment given by most of the ICUs and doctors because protocol treatment was not available. And then doctors tried and for the safety of patients to save the lives, probably that line of treatment was accepted. But when there were deaths, probably when those patients and relatives went in the court of law, there was one terminology which is called as uh, medical legal immunity to the doctors should have been given. That was the demand from IMA and various organizational bodies. Now, in this case, basically, when it is not the fault of doctor, it is fault of some consumables, maybe like IOL or some consumables. And now patient will be blaming doctor. Probably patient and relatives may say that even if it is fault of IOL or consumables, we do not know. You as doctor should have thought about it. Because we were patients coming to you, you treated the patient's eye, and we do not know about the consumables, what problem you have faced. So in that case, the liability, the problem which doctors, hospitals will be facing, I think that arrow should go to medical company that consumable company and that triangle how it will be solved in court of law because doctors will always say that it is the fault of company company will always say that it is not our fault and then to solve that case in court of law your expert comments again dr deshpande sir yes the patient will definitely say this is the fault of doctor or hospital doctor has to give evidence that it is not the fault of the doctor, but it was the fault of the company. And then either the doctor or the patient should, should file a case against the company saying that your product is faultful. And now, according to the new Consumer Protection Act, faulty product or production is responsibility of the consumer consumer the production service records provider so service provider is production industry so they are responsible to provide without any fault the product and if it is proved the company has to be ordered for that in many cluster infections particularly i can say because uh, all over india everybody knows in indoor case also and some uh, cluster infection orissa and patna also where uh, 15 16 patients were infected all these were proved that the irrigation fluid was infected and they were saved but unfortunately because they were trust hospitals nobody going against the company in the court so uh, the company was not sued only the compensations was given to the patients through the social workers and social things our government and the matter was closed but doctors were 100 percent saved out of that because of this that showing that they, it was the fault of the company separate case should be filed against the company then only court can order otherwise in the same case court cannot order against the company thank you sir thank you Do we have any other questions? Kaushik, sir? I'll uh, ask how, like, if there is a task uh, in a uh, personal setup, then how to go about it? Like, the, I have uh, task three cases today. Like, yesterday I operated five cases and three cases I am seeing some inflammation. So, I today I have around six or seven cases. Do I postpone them and what do I do? I will say you should stop the OT, lock the OT, 
do uh, take go, good uh, swaps and everything and every precaution find out the cause and cause may not be found out and then if it is proved that it is not the ot causing then again you can start and by the time you treat the patient and refer to the vitreo retinal if you are not yourself a vitreo retinal probably if it is proved that it is tas don't use the same lens that should suffice isn't it yeah uh i don't think we have any more questions yeah here. one last comment from my side i think in the past maybe doctors like pande uh, must have realized that 30 years ago 25 years ago when such unfortunate incidents of end up used to happen or pan panda even panophthalmitis patients and relatives used to accept that they were saying that okay it was in our luck it was our bad luck and it was getting accepted but in today's era even if there is tas or end up or some of these uh, unfortunate incidences are not acceptable by the society and there are challenges in the court of law medically really there are so many issues which are coming up i think uh, the changing yes, scenario yes. Uh, in last 25 years and you know that particular journey you must have experienced yeah i have question. in the field 19th from the 1970 hmm. and in the early period of 1970 to 1980 I have taken about 477, 67 eye camps in Marathwada area because I was having a mobile unit for ophthalmic care. And mm -hmm. every camp was not more than five, six 600 or 1,000 operations in the camp. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were four, five renowned surgeons used to come and operate, including me, Dr. Bhalchandra, and uh, so on. So after the camp, not a single camp was there where pan ophthalmitis was not there and where we have not eviscerated at least three, four eyes. But that was accepted by the patient because there was no law against the doctor as a consumer protection act at that time. So it was very easy to tackle the patient and patients were also accepting that whatever done is best for the do by the doctors that is our fault or our luck and that attitude is not there at present so it has become reverse so now since the consumer protection act for doctor is there the things are reversed that's true over to you dr dipansh arti ma'am do you have any questions No, the Pancho. No questions from mine. I think if we don't have any other comments or questions, uh, we can close the meeting. Uh, Kaushik sir, can you give the vote of thanks? Yes, I, I'll sincerely thank Dr. Uh, Arvind Haripriya, ma'am, Dr. Uh, Sapnil Parchan, sir, and Dr. Anand Deshmukh, uh, Anand Pandey. This part is, this part is, sir. Uh, don't forget my name. <laughs> yes, sorry, sir. Yeah. And... Uh, Dr. Despande sir, Dr. Mathu sir and Dr. Marathe sir has been our uh, strongest pillars and they have been supporting us from the uh, beginning. And I'll thank our uh, audience also who have stayed uh, so long for this uh, presentation. And I think we learned something new today and uh, we'll be more prepared to tackle such cases and both medically and legally. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, with your permission, I think we can uh, conclude the session. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good I will say practice without medical legal litigations. Thank yeah, you. yeah. I will say that. <laughs> Definitely don't come with the litigation. Come with the smiling face that no litigation is there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye.